Uh, hello, West Animal family. My name is Mr. H, and I'm here to share one of my favorite stories of all time. Uh, this is called The Eleventh Hour by Graham Bass. And what makes him such an amazing author is that not only did he write the uh, amazing story, but he did all these amazing illustrations that you're going to see, um, which are beautifully well done. So he's what I call a double threat in um, the author's world. So this is The Eleventh Hour by Graham Bass. Now it's a mystery story. So if you figure out um, the mystery at the end, uh, that's really great, but there's clues hidden throughout the book. So you gotta be really be um, observant to watch. When Horace turned 11, he decided there should be some kind of celebrations for my friends, he thought, and me. For though I've been the age of eight and nine and six and seven, this is the very first time that I've ever been 11. With that, he set to work and wrote the name of every guest, and then 11 sorts of foods that elephants like best. He wrote the invitations next and sent them off that day, and finally, 11 games for everyone to play. Now, Horace was a clever lad. He planned the day with care, ensuring that his party would be quite a grand affair. But only in the kitchen was his genius unfurled, for elephants are verily the best cooks in the world. He started off with cheesecake full of strawberries and cream, then moved on through the pastries to a chocolate supreme. And though it may be said perhaps that Horace made a mess, the feast that he created was fantastic, nothing less. It was early in the morning when the party guests arrived, and all their wearing costumes most intriguingly contrived. The pig came as an admiral, the zebra as a punk, the rhino was an astronaut, his spacesuit made of junk. The swans arrived as Princess Pura, most enchanting sight, bejeweled with rows of precious stones and dressed in purest white. And with her came an Indian with arrows, spirits, and bows, a handsome bangle tiger whom no one seemed to know. The mouse came as a musketeer, his head and hat held high, a swagger in his footstep and a twinkle in his eye. The cat was Cleopatra, queen of Egypt and the Nile, and masquerading as a judge was Sam the crocodile. And when there was a pair of twins, two sisters, both giraffes, who turned up dressed as angels and received a round of laughs, their halos shone upon their heads two shiny golden rings, and from their nylon tutus sprouted painted cardboard wings. Beautifully drawn, and all the guests have arrived. The guests were met by Horst as they stepped into the hall. He dressed as a centurion of Rome before the fall. And once inside, they looked around and noticed with a smile the way the hall had been designed in high Renaissance style. No sooner had they entered than a rumor filled the air. They stopped the conversation and news spread everywhere. Their host had made a banquet. It was huge, immense in size. And one by one, the guests were drawn within to feast their eyes. For there upon the table was the feast that Horace made, a wonder spread of cakes and buns and jugs of lemonade. And in the midst, a centerpiece of grand design was placed that left no doubt young Horace had supreme artistic taste. But if the guests had hoped to eat the banquet then and there, they soon found out their host had planned for what they'd eat when and where. For Horace told them firmly, not a crumb would they devour until the time he had set the 11th hour. The game began at 8.05, a sack race marked the start. The sacks of every size and shape so everyone took part. They set off at a cracking pace with Eric to the fore, but close behind the others hopped on Trotter, Hoof, and Paul. They raced across the croquet lawn, then up towards the house. But as they reached the halfway point, the pig tripped on the mouse. He landed with a heavy thud and several others fell. But Kilroy kept his balance and went on to win as well. The ballroom was a venue for the second party game. But though the rules were simple, no one seemed to know the aim. 
They charged around a ring of chairs beneath the chandeliers, while Sam played Mozart's magic flute and British grandeliers. And one by one, the chairs became just piles of splintered wood. The guests all agreed that this new game was jolly good. Then as the final chair collapsed, they stopped and checked the score. And since no one had won at all, they settled on a draw. The prig procured a pack of cards and soon a game began, but unbeknownst to all the rest, the admiral had a plan. For Oliver won every trick, his conquest was complete. A string of luck, or could the porker be a cheat? A little later in the day, some guests played snakes and ladders upon a board that squirmed and turned with pythons, apps, and adders. The board was set, the race was on, the game had just begun. Then Thomas went and ate the dice, <laughs> so no one ever won. A cricket match was organized for those who knew the game. The twin giraffes had no idea, but fielded just the same. But Oliver, a boastful pig, had made it understood that when it came to batting, he was rather quite good. The tiger donned the keeper's glove and crouched behind the stumps and waited for a chance to show his skills at leaps and jumps. The pig went for a mighty swing, but only clipped the ball. And Maxwell leapt and caught him out. Pride comes before the fall. The cricket match had finished when the zebra took his cue and challenged tiny Kilroy to a game of pool or two. But Kilroy's skill was quite immense for somebody so small. Though Eric thought he'd win hooves down, he didn't sink a ball. The other guest enjoyed a lively game of blind man's bluff. With Piggy in the middle, you'd think he'd had enough. He blundered blindfold round the room and groped and grabbed and gripped while all the others squealed with joy and dodged and ducked and dipped. A tennis match was underway a little later on with crocodile and tiger versus elephant and swan. The elephant was shaky. He appeared to have lost his nerve. The score was 40-30 with crocodile to serve. Sam tossed the ball into the air and struck it with such force that horse didn't see it start upon its fateful course. And sure enough, it hit poor horse square upon the head. Game, set, and match, the tiger cried. That's life, poor horse said. And meanwhile, midst Egyptian columns, row on silent row, a seeker searched while others hid a game that we all know. But though, though through her eyes were large and bright, the cat's success was small. For while she searched with utmost care, she found no one at all. Do you see them hiding from her? They're playing hide and seek. And far upon the hill beyond the tennis court, the rhino and the zebra sat in silence deep in thought. They studied every rook and pawn, each king and queen and knight. They both agreed it looked too hard and quit without a fight. The final game was tongue of war, two teams of equal weight. But every mind was on the feast, the time was getting late. The rhino slipped, the game was lost, they cared not in the least. For finally the hour had come, t'was time to eat the feast. My friends, said Horace to his guests, my friends, lend me your ears. For now it is I that I, your host, have reached 11 years. But if he planned to make a speech, his virtues were a spouse. He missed his chance, cause everyone took off towards the house. They raced each other up the stairs, 11 steps in all. Then past the marble statues leading to the banquet hall. And there they stopped. Nobody spoke. They stood in disbelief. For all the food had disappeared. Aghast, they cried, a thief. 
The cakes had turned to scattered crumbs. No cream was to be seen, and nothing now remained where once the chocolate mousse had been. The centerpiece had toppled. Not a strawberry was left. But who, they cried, could possibly manage such a theft? The zebra said, it wasn't I, by all my stripes I'd rather die. The tiger said, it wasn't me, I have far too much integrity. Then Cora cried, it wasn't us, we wouldn't dare cause such a fuss. And Kilroy squeaked, I'm far too small, one mouse could never eat at all. The swan looked darkly at the pig, the thief must be someone who's big. But Oliver denied all guilt and said, now Thomas, he's well built. The rhino sobbed through sniffs and tears. I've known our host for years and years, and though my appetite is large, I must deny this dreadful charge. We're all trying to find out who ate the feast. The cat had yet to say a word, which Eric thought could be inferred, as prima fancy evidence of feline guilt ray this offense. But Alexandria lashed her tail. Your theories are to no avail. We cats do not steal others' food. It's wicked, bad, and very rude. The judge was next. I, too, deny. Although I have no alibi, all blames for this horrendous crime. He babbled on for quite some time. I'm not the kind of crocodile to fake a tear or force a smile. My countenance is plain to read. My friends, I did not do this deed. So everyone has their excuses on why they didn't do it. The mystery was curious. The guests were at a loss. But Horace had inventive. He showed them who was boss. The feast was gone. We can't change that. But now it's clear to see that what we need is cheering up. Just leave it all to me. He rushed into the kitchen and was gone for quite a while. Then he reemerged with sandwiches, a flourish, and a smile. This is not as fancy as the birthday feast, he said, but 11 times as healthy because it's made with whole wheat bread. Then as they sat and ate their lunch, there came one last surprise when Horace asked for everyone to kindly close their eyes. And there it was, the birthday cake. The guests all clapped and cheered. He had kept it in the kitchen and it hadn't disappeared. And so they picnicked on the lawn until the evening fell, and everyone left satisfied. The day had finished well. But in the end, although the thief was someone they all knew, they never found out who it was that stole the feast. Can you? If you are clever and careful enough, there are clues hidden on every page of this amazing book to help you solve the mystery. I hope you enjoyed The Eleventh Hour by Graham Bass. It's one of my favorites. And maybe now it could be one of yours. Thanks, Wildcats.